Welcome everybody to today's webinar, Make Wrong Deliveries a Thing of the Past and How Better Data Improves Your Supply Chain Management. And my name is David Giesinger, I'm your host today and I'm very happy to announce our three speakers of today's webinar, which is Andrew Goddard from CDQ, Pascal Dubosson from Dun & Bradstreet Europe, and our star speaker, big guest of today, one and only data whisperer, Scott Taylor. And without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to you, Scott. All right. Hello, everybody. Morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Scott Taylor, the data whisperer, here to share with you kind of an intro to kick things off before uh, Pascal and Andrew get into the meat of things, but how to make wrong deliveries a thing of the past. We all want to make that a thing of the past. The last thing you want are more wrong deliveries, that's for sure. So a little bit about my background, Scott Taylor, the data whisperer, spoiler alert, you probably noticed already, I don't do a whole lot of whispering. We save that for the data. We've got to calm data down. We've got to tame data, that's for sure. I wrote a book called Telling Your Data Story, Data Storytelling for Data Management, a way to talk about the importance of the topic today to your business leadership. I used to work at Dun & Bradstreet, and actually I'm responsible for the fact that they actually call it master data today. So that was my effort while I was at D&B. Worked uh, very closely with Pat Garlick, who you can see up there, who's now the uh, head of marketing for um, D&B Europe. Also worked with the folks at CDQ over the last few years as well, and I'm very enamored with their data sharing community, the way they share expertise and pull all these um, in peers together to help manage their data. I'm probably most known for my too much tech talk puppet show so you should check that out on uh, that out on youtube as well starring the cdo the chief dog officer but everything i do and everything i speak about is a data evangelism as a service for enterprises and tech brands helping everybody everywhere understand the strategic importance and value of properly managing your data for your organization and kicking it right off here one of the most important things to remember, no matter what you're doing in your organization, is that you've got to determine the truth in your data before you derive meaning. You've got to do data management, master data, reference data, metadata, MDM, RDM, PIM, all those foundational things first before you spend any time deriving meaning through analytics, data science, visualization, and all that other great stuff. That's important, but if you don't have that truth, you can't properly derive meaning. Now, the topic of today is this data challenge. All enterprises, no matter what size you are, struggle with ship to data. How do you acquire it, manage it, trust it, standardize it in a cost-effective way? You absolutely need it. You've got to get your goods to the folks who get value out of it, however that happens to be. But if you do that, you've got to do that in a cost-effective way as well, and you've got to do that in a standardized, trusted way. A lot of this data comes in from a lot of crazy places and isn't necessarily mastered as well as it should be. And we're going to show you some techniques and some approaches that we think are going to help you do that. Now, in essence, every organization has, let's say, a geography. Call this yellow polygon a market, a country a sales market, a media market, a measurement market. It might be a province, a city, a state, a zip code, a postal code, some configuration of geography. You're shipping things to that geography. Here are your ship to points. They might be different customers. They might be different types of ship twos. They roll up to different sell twos and plan twos. And that part of the hierarchy has their ship twos wherever they want them. And you've got to know what markets they are in. So this crazy modern art configuration here helps people understand, I'm shipping things to yellow, what ship two points are there? I'm working with green, what markets are they in? I'm dealing with blue, what's their geographic footprint and do they compete or overlap with red? These kind of generic and sort of uh, metaphorical business questions you run into every day. So you've got to have those ship two points aligned across the rest of the hierarchy as well. And that's certainly a challenge. How do you structure these ship twos so you can use them operationally more efficiently? There are four things that every ship two has to have. It has to have uniqueness. 
So you have some sort of unique identifier. Obviously, the, the star unique identifier of today is the Duns number, which Pascal will take you through about. But you, you, you've got that unique identifier for every ship to. You have to have a hierarchy. Roll that ship to up to the bill to the plan to the cell to all those different levels of the parent child relationship. If you're shipping to the lower left oval, did you realize it's related to the lower right oval? You've got to have that. You have to have segmentation, some sort of category. What kind of thing are you shipping to? Is it a business partner? Are you getting it from a supplier? Is it a, what type of warehouse is it? What kind of ship to point is it? All those things that happen in terms of the segmentation and certainly the type of business that ship to belongs to. And then you need that geography, some form of geography as well. Now I roll these up and I call them very simply the four C's of master data, a code, a company, a category, and a country. And once you have those, you know where everything is, you know what kind of thing it is, you know who owns it, and you know it's unique. I just take a moment here and have remind you of all the data problems that go away when you've got this kind of common structure on the data that's the most important to your organization. Now, speaking of kind of the importance of data here and measuring this value. Here is a actual poll that Gartner did where they asked organizations, do they measure the value of master data? 90% said, no, we don't measure it. And 10% said other. I'm assuming yes is in other. I don't know why it eludes folks here. So whether you believe in Gartner or not, let me give you the statement you can bring to your leadership. Master data is your most important data. It is the data in charge of your business. It's the most powerful data you've got in your organization. It can help you grow your business, improve your business, and protect your business, sometimes all with the same record. It's the data about those most important parts of your business, your relationships, Customer, vendor, partner, prospect, citizen, brand, patient, client, ship to, bill to, plan to, sell to. And it's also the data in other domains about your brands and services. So it becomes the data you've got structured around the things you make, the people you sell to and buy from and partner with. And I don't know what other data in your organization is more important than that. So if anybody gives you any pushback on that, you're welcome to send them to me. I'll help convince them that master data is the most important data in your organization. Now we talked about the data challenge, but we also wanna talk about that business challenge and ship to master data can be very difficult to manage. It's often the bulk of the names and locations you have in your file. Sometimes it could just be a root driver keying in something that helps them get to where they need to go but it doesn't have that structure, doesn't have that hierarchy structure and that taxonomy and those geographies that we talked about. Because the, the only reason that person put it in was to make sure they could get to that right place. So frequently, it's of the lowest quality. And it's well past an irony here that it can cause the highest potential for pain and consequence, cause very expensive frustration. What could bother a customer more than sending their stuff to the wrong place? So it's, it, it's as critical to your business as anything else. So how do you find this cost-effective way to manage it? When people are looking at how to manage things and what's important for their organization, I always urge them to look at their core competency. Why does your business exist? Are you an industrial manufacturer? Are you a financial services organization? I'm sure there's lots of different sectors represented today on this call. I doubt any of them, except for the speakers, actually make data for a living. And again, my whole career is working for organizations like that, Dun & Bradstreet, Nielsen, and so on, who provide master data as a service, MDAS as I called it, pre-mastered commercial content, a way to leverage someone else's expertise whether it's from the Dun & Bradstreet source or whether it's from CDQ's data community to help you do that work. Your job and your organization isn't in business to make data. So find some help out there. And that's the point of today. I urge all of you and you owe it to yourself and your own organization to explore every possible opportunity. The days of doing everything yourself are long over. You've got to find ways to get help especially when it's this kind of foundational stuff. 
And this is the kind of stuff that doesn't really offer you any extra competitive advantage. It's what you do with those places that does. It's what you do with that data that's the advantage, not making it yourself. So when you think about the core competency of the two partners that we're going to talk about today, they bring a lot to that party. And speaking of C's, here's a whole bunch more of them. They obviously bring a community of like-minded folks who share their expertise and sometimes even their data about these ship twos and other parts of the hierarchy. They bring this standardized commercial content about those entities that you can then leverage in your own process. So their combined capabilities here between CDQ and Dun & Bradstreet are pretty amazing. And again, they'll show you what they've got. They certainly have the coverage of the planet we're on here. We're limiting our conversation to Earth today. So if you're shipping stuff to Mars yet, maybe it's outside of our scope, but it's <laughs> we're, we're focusing on the real ship twos that we're all dealing with. And there's clearly a cost-effective way to do that. So without further ado, let me hand it off to Pascal, who then hand it off to Andrew, Andrew, and then we'll talk about how making how you can make ship two data and problems with ship twos a thing of the past. Well, thank you very much, Scott, for this energized introduction, as always, and especially considering that this is only one of four web webinars that you're uh, speaking today. So today we are really excited to demonstrate through Dun & Bradstreet Europe's partnership with CDQ, how your company can manage the entire business partner data quality process in a holistic and cost-effective way by combining CDQ's proven expertise in governing master data quality and Dun & Bradstreet's global single source of business reference data, you can finally get your entire business partner data quality nearer to 100% through one single point of entry, a quality that your company and your customers deserve. The partnership between Dun & Bradstreet and CDQ is designed to be complementary and in line with DMP's vision to enable a global network of trusted data, enabling companies to turn uncertainty into confidence, risk into opportunity, and potential into prosperity. Probably no one knows better than Scott about the value of power of data, since he's called the data whisperer. Forrester says that insights-driven businesses are growing around 30% per year. And according to a McKinsey report, data-driven companies are 23 times more likely to acquire new customers than their peers who are not data-driven. Clearly, harnessing the power of data and insights improves performance and drives growth. But it's not easy. The volume and velocity of data flowing into your organizations can be overwhelming and create complexity. And if you think about all the different business relationships your company has, from customers to suppliers, prospects and partners, from pay to to ship to addresses, the number of associated data points gets very large very fast. Turning this data into insights is not trivial, but that's the business Dun & Bradstreet has been in since its foundation in 1841. In 2021, Dun & Bradstreet in Europe and around the globe still provide the unique data universal numbering system, in short Dun's number, which was invented in 1962 as a means to identify a particular business. You can think of it almost like a fingerprint of a legal entity. Many multinational organizations rely on this externally verifiable identity check and have thus formalized a simple data governance rule. It says no dance, no vendor. At DMP Europe, one of our strongest growth area is in the segment of master data services, also for compliance teams. We help customer identify corporate structures and beneficial ownership hierarchies to comply with trade sanctions or anti-money laundering regulations. Today, we capture more than double of company data in countries like China or Brazil versus only one year ago. More and more customers are also screening their business partners for environmental, social and governance risk. This is one of the key areas where DMP is currently investing more in order to source comprehensive data regarding the carbon footprint of companies and industry sectors in the supply chain. 
Sustainability is at the top of mind for many executives as consumers and regulators alike are expecting concrete steps and more action to be taken. Whilst companies are more sensitive today when it comes to the environmental impact of their supply chains, the reduction of waste in general and responsible sourcing is still a key challenge. But how about reducing the waste of time, the most finite resources of all? At Dun & Bradstreet, we've been helping companies since decades to manage their pay to and sold to addresses, as we've been building the largest global entity database. This allows a concise view of your business partners by building a golden customer record, for example, and even prior to have your sales force contact only those prospects with a high propensity buying intent. As a typical example of a company that has seen quite a few firmographic changes in the past years, I always like to show our own example of our company to demonstrate the entity resolution process. With only one DMP dance number to be matched against all these current and former names and addresses, you would be surprised how many purchase orders or supply portal registrations access form still reach us with long out of date information. But not all address information is stored in the official registries that we access for our trusted data, especially when it comes to ship to names and locations but not delivering your goods in the right quality to the right location on the first time may lead to fraud and it always creates friction, frustration and frowns on your customer faces. So today we'd like to show you together with our partner CDQ how to address this specific issue and attain a level of data quality that is higher than you expected. When it comes to data and digitalization, big companies tend to invest in big visions when sometimes all they really need is a magnifying glass. Ensuring the accuracy and freshness of your corporate data quality is not a trivial task. And as Scott mentioned before, it's probably also not written in your key mission and vision statements either. Dun & Bradstreet and our partner CDQ take on the detailed and complex work of global data sourcing and verification as well as change management so that you don't have to you are simply able to leverage our work to address your business needs. So with this, I now like to hand over to Andrew Goddard from CDQ to show us how. Andy, the stage is yours. Many thanks indeed, Pascal. So just in case anybody hasn't heard already of CDQ, we're a spin-off of the University of St. Gallen and CDQ stands for Corporate Data Quality. So we started in 2006 as a research consortium to drive and innovate uh, corporate data quality management with some industry giants at that time. In 2015, we incorporated nine years of innovation and knowledge into a new uh, data quality software business, which we called Data Quality as a Service. By 2018, we'd captured the attention of some more industry giants, and also we'd started to integrate DMB into Data Quality as a Service to help align it with common industry practices. Last year, Gartner recognized CDQ in its hype cycle for inter-enterprise MDM. And what happened to the original research consortium? Well, it continues to this day. It's known as the CDQ Competence Center, and it's led by Professor Dr. Christine Legner at the University of Lausanne. So in the next 25 minutes or so, we're going to look at why CDQ teamed up with DMB. We'll look at some key components of a combined CDQ and DMB service. We'll look at some simple examples before we'll finish with a wrap up and a Q&A uh, before we close out. So first of all, let's look at why CDQ and TMB teamed up. So figuring out how to cost effectively manage 100% of the business partner domain is not so easy, as Scott already said. So on average, 20% of a company's business partners generate approximately 80% of its spend and sales revenue. Conversely, 80% of the business partners generate only 20% of the spend and revenue. Let's just think about that for a moment. If a domain contains a million business partners and each one has a one sold to, a bill to and a ship to, then potentially we're talking about two to three million names and locations that need to be created and constantly updated. So it's obvious why people look towards the 80-20 rule to try to manage data quality. Clearly, cost effective and efficient are really important. So to meet the challenge, 
CDQ teamed up with DMB, and the goal, well, the goal was simple: how to meet the challenge realistically and cost-effectively. In a moment, we'll look at what key service components are required to help improve business partner master data quality. But before we do that, what should a service help solve for? Well, it should help avoid or reduce the causes of low quality business partner data. And the good news is that top causes can mostly be avoided. They are ineffective governance and data quality inaccuracies, communication inaccuracies, and website entry inaccuracies. So if we're going to use a combined service, what are we trying to create? Well, master data quality and content. But to what level and what standard of quality? Well, one simple interface helps us to manage the data quality, and that should have uh, access or global coverage for partner partner verification. But verified against what exactly? Well, clearly we have many sources. We have uh, official registers. We have DMB's entire global database and all of their company profiles. There are about 200 million records or, or um, identities um, uh, on uh, Google's uh, source data. And of course, then over the top of all of that, we're talking about uh, applying data quality rules or governance to ensure that the data quality that we're creating is of a certain standard. And that standard should be the standard that we have uh, designed in our data quality policies. Beyond that, of course, for enriching uh, the master data records that we're creating, it's great to have access to hierarchies and of course to keep all the data updated with some options for additional data if we want it. Above all, all of the services should be convenient. So I mentioned a moment ago about creating a certain standard. What kind of standards are we talking about? Well, as a minimum, well, as a basic quality standard, we look to uh, having high quality names and addresses together with very verifiable identification. The desirable quality would be high quality addresses, verifiable identification, and also business profile plus hierarchy. The minimum standard that we're looking for, of course, particularly for ship twos, is just to have the highest quality name and address. Even if we can't verify it or we can't add additional data, that should be the minimum standard, and that's perfectly okay for ship twos. So in a moment, we're just about to look now to uh, our first example. This is going to be an end to end example just to show you how the service can look like. And we're going to look here at all three quality standards, the minimum standard, the basic standard and the desired standard. For this particular example, we're going to use Del Hayes, which is a supermarket chain in Belgium. So our real world situation is pretty normal. We're trying to create a business partner and ship to location data, but we only have partial address information to hand. In this particular case, we simply have uh, a street, a number, and a town and a country. This is pretty much standard, I would say. But how can we improve that? What we're wanting to do, of course, is curate the missing data. We'd like to do it digitally and in real time, compliantly with our data quality policies and without duplicating existing business partner records. So how can that be done? Well, first of all, let's look at the minimum standard we mentioned earlier. The minimum standard is having a high quality name and address. So simply by curating the address, we're able to curate integration ready data with the missing information now automatically created. In this particular case, a postcode that was never uh, in the input data, two digit country code, which is great for ERP systems of segmentation. One of the four C's that Scott spoke about earlier. A region and a county, super for segmentation. Town, a street number, uh, a street and number, which is uh, structured, uh, which is great uh, for integration. And of course, some long lack codes. There we have the core of a great quality name and address. And this will be the minimum standard. The standard as uh, within CDQ system here can be uh, can be uh, managed through data quality rules. I mentioned earlier that we have 1,700 data quality rules 
which are freely available to uh, the members of uh, CDQ service. This helps to validate the data and make sure that it's uh, meeting the minimum standards that we expect of the name and address. In this particular case, yes. So how can we now move on to the next level of standard, which is uh, which is uh, the basic standard? And that's, of course, now to verify the name and address. Well, here we can go straight to lookup. Here we're applying uh, governance now to be able to search for uh, this particular business and to identify all of its uh, legal identifiers. In this particular case, we're uh, doing a public search against the Bells and Business Registers, also against the VAT Register and the legal entity identifier. None of this information we had in the first place, but now we're able to gather this en route to creating the business partner. And once we're happy, we can, we're ready effectively to start creating the business partner. But before I move on, why should you care about that? Well, first of all, business partners can be complex. And secondly, data chaos is really easy to create and incredibly hard to fix later. So let's look at what we just did. We were aiming for desirable standards. That meant, first of all, getting a great quality name and address. Moving through to our basic standard, which was to get out or gather together all of our identifiers. And of course, that enables us then to verify for the bill to not just the sold to the bill to were able to verify the VAT registration number, not just to have the number, but rather to check that the number is first of all valid, which is uh, which is done directly against the uh, the VAT registration, the VIS, the so-called VIS, and um, also that the name that we have matches with the VAT number on the VAT register. In this case, yes. Now we move straight to the desirable standard, of course, which is to start to view the hierarchy. In this particular case, we see Del Hayes reporting up through to its parent and to its global ultimate parent. At the same time, DMV's profiles uh, give us an overall view of the business, its size, how long it's been in business, and its overall um, hierarchy structure, as we can see here, Del Hayes has a family tree structure of nearly 3,700 companies, so a very large company. Are we done yet? Well, not really, because as Scott mentioned and what this webinar is all about are the ship twos. Del Hayes has 3,300 supermarkets that all need to be shipped to. Now, of course, no one's suggesting for a moment that you're going to create 3,300 ship twos on your business partner, but for sure, all of your stuff, whatever it is you're selling, needs to go somewhere so that it can get to the ship twos. Now it either goes direct to the ship twos, in which case you would need 3,300 of them, or more likely it will go to a logistics organization, it might be DHL, it may be KNN, it could be Deutsche Bahn Schenker, Lufthansa, it could be any of these organizations and more. And certainly, you getting your stuff needs to go to the right place. So, which, so whatever type of ship to you have, whether that's direct ship twos or that's waypoints, pickup points, collection points, all of those need to be attached to your business partner and to be done at the highest quality. In this particular case, meeting at least the minimum standard, which is just a great quality name and address. A great quality name and address allows you to get your things to the right place, at least. These data quality rules are governing the whole process. And if you thought this was complex and the interconnectedness seems pretty daunting, then just imagine the parent. The parent is at our whole their house group, and here we speak about 7,000 supermarkets with 18 branded business lines across three continents. That's one supply chain, or that's one very complex supply chain and a very large business partner. So for this second example, Let's look at something just slightly more complex, which is not just an incomplete name and address, but rather an incomplete and a wrong name and address. How can it be improved? Is it possible? Let's use the same example we were looking at before, Del Hayes. We have an incomplete street name, 
we have an incomplete town name and we have a wrong postcode and everything else is missing. And our wish, of course, is still is actually to correct now the wrong data and still to curate the missing data. And as before, to do this without duplicating existing business partners to do it real time. But now with this wrong and incomplete information, does it stop us? No, it doesn't. If we there is enough information here to be able to correct the postcode, correct the town name, correct the street name, still give it its long lack codes and pass all data quality standards. Of course, once we've done that, then we'll continue as we saw in an earlier in the earlier example. Another simple example of our just everyday situation would be to where we need to create a business partner uh, that can't be verified anywhere. It's not on a business register. It's not on a business database. These are the really hard ones to curate. So let's have a little example of that. Typically, these kind of organizations would be the micro businesses that just fall underneath the radar of business registers or business databases. Um, or alternatively, a, an everyday ship to, which is of course a, a factory premises or a warehouse or all of these operational names and addresses that companies have uh, that are not their legal names and addresses, but they're that's where you have to do your business and therefore you need to get the name and address right. In this particular example, we're just going to look at a micro business here. It's really easily identifiable on Google. You can find many of these. And our wish is still exactly the same. How do we verify the name and the location if it's possible? And then how do we curate it in, uh, in an efficient and integrated way rather than copy pasting information, which is the typical way of doing things. So on Google, of course, if we click through, for sure we can see a name and address. Uh, the number of times we've seen full addresses like this, including the country, just literally copied from Google and pasted into address line one inside of, uh, of, inside of an ERP system can't be counted. This is, this is daily business seeing this, but it doesn't have to be that way. Instead, it's possible to, uh, enter the uh, the name and address uh, as shown here. Actually, when creating this um, this uh, screenshot, what I actually did here was I omitted the number. I didn't put 25 in just to demonstrate another function that you will see in a moment. So if we look up this particular business, we now see Amber Bistro, it's on Google Places. So this gives us at least a publicly available um, evidence that that this particular business exists and where. And also, as you can see on the screenshot here, you'll see a, a bunch of other records. Because I didn't enter uh, the number 25, what you can see here are that nearby locations. Now to try to avoid uh, duplicating this particular business or the, the, the risk of duplicating it, the results are showing nearby located businesses on the same street as you can see here, 26, 29 and so on, so that are very close by physically. Even though they don't have the same name, it's simply a method of showing you that you potentially are creating a duplicate just to that you're extra careful with things like that. So despite it not being on any kind of business register or any kind of business database, as usual, we're able to just curate it live and in real time with a great quality name and address. Just to avoid any doubt, we mentioned we keep mentioning APIs and integration and so on. And what you've seen so far are web apps. Uh, the reason for that is that web apps are just really easy to, in a in a webinar environment, just to demonstrate uh, some functionality without everybody being distracted. So, just to avoid any doubt, here are uh, CDQ's APIs working in in. Uh, typical ERP system environments. In this particular case, we have a data quality validation that's automated into, uh, into SAP. We can see the data quality rules here just popping up on screen. Of course, because it's an API, everything's happening behind the mask, but nevertheless, here's the clue that CDQ is, is built in there. Alternatively, if we're going to do the lookups as we saw before on the web app, then uh, if that's happening in this particular case inside of SAP, then the search with all of the external data sources is shown here. Uh, and this then allows us to create a valid business partner with the data being already pre-validated. Here's another example of integrating DMB data into the MDG. 
uh, via CDQ. And now I keep mentioning data quality rules. So here's an example of uh, fairly standard system data quality rules. Of course, each all ERP systems are built with uh, uh, data quality rules uh, inbuilt. Um, CDQs, I mentioned we have uh, 1,700. Those have been built up now over a 15-year period by uh, our members and, and by CDQ itself. And here you see that those data quality rules uh, are, are really quite specific and, and very detailed. So you can see here that the VAT registration number that was entered on the standard rules, it kind of said, hey, this is not really a valid VAT registration, but there's not a lot of information why. And uh, CDQ are giving absolute information here, saying it's just an invalid format for a German uh, EU uh, VAT number. Uh, it can't be found on the VAT register, so that's a really good reason why it's not valid. Uh, and also the checksum digit at the end uh, just doesn't add up. So you're getting some really clear instructions here that the VAT number that you're trying to validate is just simply wrong and you need to go away and find the right one. So for our final visual case study here, I'm just going to look at a real life story. This story kind of tracks through almost like the first example, but you'll notice towards the end that there's a tiny, tiny ship to mistake. And unfortunately, it leads to some pretty undesirable supply chain consequences. So the example is, is about Lamborghini. So as I say, it's a real life story. So we all know Lamborghini, but do you know where the trucks need to go before they can go anywhere near the production site? And also, do you know the connection between Lamborghini, uh, Audi and Volkswagen? Well, the connection is really simple. A Lamborghini is part of the Volkswagen group. And, uh, and actually it reports directly up to Audi into the Volkswagen Group. You'll see a picture here of the Lamborghini Urus. This is important because when the Lamborghini Urus was being designed, it was clear that it couldn't be built inside of the existing historical compound that had built every car previously. In the white here, you see the old or the, uh, the, the historical production site before Urus. And in the yellow, you see the production site after Urus. Effectively, the entire production site doubled in size. And as a result of that, it changed everything. It changed, and particularly it changed everything for, for deliveries because the deliveries now couldn't go as they had previously done, but rather they needed to go somewhere else. Now, in this particular example, it's very easy to validate the, uh, the, the sold to. So as always, the sold to is Lamborghini via Modena. So this is very simple. Also, what we can see is that uh, the, the bill to is also really easy to validate here. And we can see that the VAT registration number, everything is live as you would expect with Lamborghini. And of course that it all matches the name. So this is all really simple stuff. With, uh, with the help of DMB here, we can automatically see that Lamborghini is reporting directly up to Audi and ultimately up to Volkswagen, and we can get a nice business overview of Lamborghini. So everything good so far. What about the uh, the ship twos? Well, I would say this one is more of a waypoint rather than a, a rather than a ship two, because of course the ship two will be all of the production site here, the finishing plant, the uh, the assembly plant, the the, the paint uh, shop, and so on and so forth. So ultimately, if you're supplying something to Lamborghini, it will end up somewhere in here. But first, you've got to go over here, which is a waypoint, and you must go there first. Otherwise, you don't get anywhere near the production site. And here's where it is. It's actually off the production site. This is what off the production site looks like. This building here, number 30, actually used to be an old Lamborghini uh, corporate office that is on DMB's database, but the um, the ship two is over here in number 26. This is what it looks like. This is the truck registration point. And this actually is just, as usual, is just really easy to curate. You just need to know where it is and we can curate the rest. So everything is really simple, but what went wrong? I said it was a real story. Well, an organization was indeed trying to do exactly what I've just shown you. When it came to getting the ship to address, the agent that was uh, that was uh, creating the business partner searched the ship to address using Google, which is just normal. You can try this yourself if you just put in Via Ferruccio Lamborghini uh, 26 into Google, 
if you don't know any more than that, the very first result you'll get is reasonably close by. It's in the same, it's in the reasonably same geography, but it's just in the wrong postcode. It's actually 17 kilometers away from the right postcode. So two different streets, very close to each other or 17 kilometers apart from each other, but not only one street. How can that happen? Well, like pretty much in every other country, if you're famous and Ferruccio Lamborghini is famous, then you start to get streets named after you, but not just one. There's lots of them. There's actually about eight throughout Italy. So in this particular case, the driver arrived at the right time at the wrong place, transporting lamp parts to Lamborghini. But believe it or not, was parked between the Ferrari Museum and the production plant of Maserati. It actually got worse because the wrong postcode had been entered into the ERP, the ERP system. Just a genuine standard mistake, but it had been entered. And two more delivery attempts were made, but with different drivers, before the error was realised and corrected. And what's the uh, supplier status today? Well, sadly, the supplier status is still a want-to-be supplier, not a supplier because they were on test, they got it wrong, and uh, and and uh, Lamborghini still have them in the background. They're trying to, uh, well, fortunately, still trying to prove themselves. So this is a tale of uh, how a tiny, tiny little mistake can lead to, you know, really uh, a, a bad consequence. And with that, I'd now like to uh, hand over back to Scott just to do a nice wrap up before we move to the Q&A section. All right, nice job, gentlemen. So you can see me. I guess Lamborghini got some ship too wrong because my car hasn't arrived yet. I, I, I don't know where it could be. That example about a hold is just so relevant. Any of you in the package goods world know that delivering to individual stores, you know, I shop at a hold, you might shop at a totally different a hold banner in Europe, but what you're looking for, if you're a supplier to that kind of organization, or you have any sort of relationship is being able to roll it up is being able to aggregate all that is being able to get some sense of my total commercial experience with another relationship and it starts at that shift too. you got to get that right and you got to get that structured correctly especially with hierarchy and categorization so your reporting can be accurate so kind of summarize it here you've got that business challenge around managing all this ship to data again a wrong ship to as andrew showed you ends up you know you end up being on the wrong side of that stick and it it can have a disproportionate amount of pain and frustration and cost to a relationship and you've got to have the rest of that structure and i can't urge you enough this is what my life's work has been as i've worked for some of these iconic data brands to really consider what your core competency is as an organization get some help get some help through other communities through other content combined capabilities that coverage the cost effectiveness nobody's saying they can do everything nobody needs everything but if you can find help for a good percentage of what you do, that's something you don't need to do that really doesn't bring strategic value to your organization. So find those partners for sure. Anyway, I think we're gonna open it up to some questions, Oliver, if we had them there and uh, bring Andrew and Pascal back on. That uh, sums it up. There they are. Absolutely, well, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Question number one, a ship to can also be even more granular. So it could be, for example, a specific lab in a hospital. Um, how would you treat such a case? I'll take that one uh, if that's OK, David. So um, yes, ship twos can be really granular and effectively uh, the, the ship two should be treated, I guess, treating the name and the uh, and the address uh, separately. So what can be uh, easily curated, as we've already seen in the example, is the full address. Now, of course, uh, that you can enter into in any degree of granularity you like. But of course, the name that you would attach to that uh, ship to address would then be uh, perhaps the specific lab uh, or the lab number as part of the uh, uh, as, as part of the as part of the name, I guess. On the ship too so you're not restricted to having you know one business name on the ship to address you can put any name that you attach uh, that, that you like with the ship to address 
Thank you, Andy. So the next question would be. I, I, one thing I want to add with that too, and you know, obviously there's value to enrich that kind of location data too with as what we keep mentioning, the categorization, the subcategory, the channel, the subchannel, whatever it happens to be, the hierarchy on top of it, standardizing the geography so it works throughout the system. In most organizations, you know, a lot of organizations suffer from that root driver style of input versus another one. And that can gunk up the works there. So even if the that that lab location doesn't appear on a syndicated database, the other enrichment and structure that you need would. So that's where a partnership really helps. Exactly, Scott. So really, if you treat the business partner as being uh, the, the, the the sold to, the bill to and the ship to, then all of those names and locations fall under the business partner uh, identity. And that's exactly what you're enriching, right, Scott? And then and then rolling up under that. Mm -hmm. Just reading the second question here, I can answer that in a sentence or two as well, David, if you like. Yes, please do. So let me just uh, phrase it shortly. So you mentioned the P is system you who can leverage the other state of validation. So does it also work for CRM systems? Yes, absolutely. So there's uh, the uh, address uh, validation and the address curation is is not. Uh, is completely system agnostic. You can use it for CRM or uh, or, or really any kind of uh, uh, system. Also, it doesn't have to be API as well. So that may be even part of this question that's not been asked. An API uh, is is integrated, but we have web apps that, uh, as you've already seen on screen here, that do exactly the same thing. So uh, if you don't have an API, then that's also not a problem. Just take care of it with the web app. All right, well, let's move on. So everything today looked transactional. Do CDQ and DB, DMB services also work in bulk and batch? Any answer? Yes, absolutely. So CDQ, if you imagine from a, a curation point of view, uh, what we saw today just happening many, many, many times a minute, then uh, effectively what CDQ is doing in the background in batch is just what you've seen today, but doing it in huge chunks. Uh, clearly, we can't show you the results screen by screen, and therefore we batch everything up into uh, Excel or some other uh, uh, batch process. And as far as uh, my knowledge, uh, perhaps Pascal, you can confirm this also, DMV services are also absolutely designed to work in bulk and batch, and there's almost no restriction on volumes. Is that correct, Pascal? Yes, absolutely, especially when we have customers who want to do an initial cleansing to have a clean state of the database, then it's often the batch um, mechanisms that work best in the beginning. Exactly the same on our side as well. All right, so then what coverage can be expected? Well, uh, both CDQ and uh, DMB are uh, global. So clearly CDQ is accessing the local, the regional and the global registries and open data sources are there available to us. And also added to that then would be, uh, I mentioned it earlier about, there's about 200 million places that are accessible through CDQ on Google Places. And of course, DMB's entire global database, 420 million records, in all countries around the world and i think the only exceptions are maybe some sanctioned countries pascal could you confirm that yes so the coverage is global by of our database as well uh, with with exception of Cuba, North Korea, so the strongly sanctioned uh, countries. And as I've shown on one of my slides, um, the growth is actually quite uh, spectacular in terms of how many uh, B2B data we are uh, discovering and adding to the database, about a million a month almost. So yeah, it, it grows and grows, it get the coverage. Wow, cool. All right, well, as we reach the, the top of the hour, we would uh, like to conclude uh, today's webinar. Um, in case you were not able to ask your question, uh, please contact us after the webinar. We're very happy to include it in the FAQ document. Uh, we will, as mentioned, create a document and we'll send it along with the recording to you by 
the beginning of next week. Well, and then now I would like to thank again our three speakers. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you, Scott. And uh, also for your participation of today. So thank you for joining us today and we look forward to welcoming you again in our next webinar. Thank you very much and hopefully we'll see you soon. Many thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening.